In the 16th century, the coastal waters of what is now called Nova Scotia and Newfoundland were teeming with life. Even after centuries of fishing by the Mi'kmaq and Malecite peoples indigenous to the region, European fishermen wrote extensively of the abundance of life in the northern Atlantic. One account from veteran sailor Charles Lee describes the greatest multitude of lobsters that we have ever heard of, catching over 140 lobsters in just one haul. While another account from Father Pierre Biard claims that spawning fish were often so abundant that you cannot put your hand in the water without encountering them. But by 1992, that oceanic abundance had completely collapsed. North American cod populations dropped to 1% of their historical population level. Over the course of four centuries, the Northwest Atlantic seas went from absolute abundance to decimation. What happened? And what threats do our vast oceans face from a world based on capitalist exploitation? This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream, which now comes with Nebula for free when you sign up using the link in the description. I'm gonna attempt to collect 30 million pounds of trash from this river all by myself. And we're gonna pick up every single piece of trash on this beach. Right now, YouTube is awash in a push to clean up trash in our waterways and oceans. It's exciting to see people get motivated about environmental issues, but ocean trash is just one piece of the puzzle when it comes to unlocking exactly what endangers our seas. In fact, there are a number of other less visible, but nevertheless catastrophic threats that our seas face, like heightened acidity, temperature rise, and dead zones. Today, however, I want to focus in on just one, overfishing, a problem that not only affects our global marine ecosystem, but the 59.5 million fisher folk spread across the world. Let's go back to Newfoundland in 1992. There, fishing boats went out to sea expecting their usual catch, only to come back empty-handed. The Atlantic cod population had completely collapsed, and with it, the livelihoods of thousands of people intertwined with the North Atlantic fishing industry. And in 2000, the World Wildlife Fund even placed Atlantic cod on their endangered species list. To this day, cod populations in the Northwest Atlantic have yet to recover. But this species collapse due to relentless fishing practices is not exclusive to cod and the Northwest Atlantic. Overfishing is happening all over the world. According to the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, from 1990 to 2017, the percentage of global fish stocks within biologically sustainable levels dropped from 90% to 65.8%. In part, this is due to the continued increase of fishing across the world. As of 2018, we caught and consumed the most sea life ever in a year. And while we dine on tuna, lobster, and salmon, fish populations are paying the price. The number of fish in the sea is not infinite, and with increased stressors like higher ocean temperatures and acidity which weaken fish eggs and stunt species resilience, industrial overfishing practices are the last drop in the bucket that have pushed various fish species careening towards crisis. One study estimated that our oceans have lost more than 90% of large predatory fishes, while another analysis reveals that 82% of global fisheries are in a dangerous decline. But fishing can take a wide variety of forms, from subsistence catching to industrial scale trawling. So is there one fishing practice that is more harmful than others? Fishing can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. For a subsistence fisher in Bangladesh, fishing might look like a fishing rod and line catching one fish at a time. While for an industrial fisher along the coast of China, fishing might mean dragging large nets across the ocean floor to capture schools of fish all at once, a practice known as trawling. In total, industrial trawling represents a third of all fishing practices, and when combined with net purse fishing, large-scale industrial fishing accounts for over half of all fish caught in a year. This is a problem, 
because big net fishing, especially trawling, is one of the most destructive ways to fish. In the process of dragging large nets across the seabed, fisher folk destroy fragile ecosystems on the ocean floor, as well as indiscriminately catch what's known as bycatch, or in other words, marine life that is not commercially viable and often dies or gets thrown back into the water after the net is hauled into the boat. Think Dory in Finding Nemo. Trawling and big net purse fishing have facilitated a rise in overfishing due to the sheer volume fishing boats are able to capture per hour. In part, this industrialization of fishing gear combined with advancements in on-boat refrigeration, processing, and storage has led to increased fishery declines since the 1950s. But industrialization and new technologies aren't the only reason why we see a nearly global decline in fish stocks. These technologies are rooted in a market-based approach to fishing that has meant a constant need for growth and profit for fisherfolk. Or in other words, they need to continuously outfish and outsell their competitors in order to survive. I see the rationale for people consuming wildlife from the sea as a response to marketing. Those who want to create an appetite for fish, an appetite for lobsters and shrimp, because it's their profit that they're looking for. That's Dr. Sylvia Earle, an expert in marine life with over 30 years of experience in the ocean. For her, the massive rise in fish consumption over the last half century has been driven by marketing, which at its root is a product of capitalist profit-driven pursuits. If we turn back to the Northwest Atlantic coast, we can see that before European fisherfolk crossed the ocean in pursuit of richer fisheries, the waters there were teeming with fish, despite the fact that the Mi'kmaq and Malacite fished those waters for sustenance. Only once fisherfolk involved in a burgeoning capitalist market economy began to extensively fish for cod did the ecosystems begin to dwindle. Much like other capitalist extraction industries, fishing under capitalism has commodified certain fish like cod or bluefin tuna and is fishing them to near extinction. In a competitive fishing market, the fisherfolk who are able to catch the most amount of fish in the shortest amount of time will come out on top. A model that incentivizes large net trawling and mechanization processes that, when left unchecked, have decimated fisheries. To add insult to injury, as Brett Clark and Rebecca Clausen argue in their paper on oceanic decline and capitalism, competitive markets create incentives to expand production regardless of resource decline. Thus, in reaction to decreased stocks due to overfishing, ground fishing fleets move farther offshore. Essentially, in a capitalist market devoid of regulation, profit incentives push the fishing industry not to maintain the marine ecosystem, but instead to fish it to death and then move on to richer waters. So then how do we challenge this paradigm? When it comes to the declining health of our global waterways, there's a lot more at work than just plastic trash. In fact, extractive fishing is just one of the many threats causing marine ecosystems to crumble, which is why saving our seas has to encompass a lot more than ocean cleanups. Because cleanups are just a band-aid solution. Even if we take every piece of trash out of our waterways right now, the equivalent of a garbage truck full of plastic still continues to flow into our oceans every single minute. Only larger, more structural approaches like regulating fishing industries, implementing sustainable and regenerative fishing practices guided by indigenous leaders, or maybe for some, not eating fish altogether. In fact, a portion of ocean trash is debris from industrial fishing, like old nets and lines. But saving the oceans is also intertwined with blocking new oil pipelines, as well as disrupting fossil fuel operations that create emissions, plastics, and deadly oil spills. Which means that standing in solidarity with water protectors who stood in the way of the Keystone XL, Dakota Access, Line 3, and Line 5 pipelines, and many more, is also crucial to protecting our waterways. Ultimately, there are countless movements and organizers already working to overthrow the fossil fuel industry and extraction paradigms. Paradigms that lead to ocean trash and decimated fish populations. 
So to truly save the seas, we need to mobilize ourselves, find a place to plug in, whether that be a mutual aid organization, a local socialist chapter, or eco-sabotage group, and fight for a future where life on land and in the water isn't in danger of tipping over the edge. During this video, you might have noticed that I left out a growing industry that's slowly piling more fish onto our plates. Aquaculture. It's a huge topic, and I felt that it deserved more than just a one sentence mention in this video. So instead, I wrote a small section covering the key issues of fish farming. But I cut it out of this video because I felt like it was a tangent and I wanted to appease the YouTube algorithm. So I've uploaded that section as an extended edition of this video on the streaming platform my creator friends and I built called Nebula. The bonus content replaces this ad because there aren't any ads on Nebula. And you'll not only see a lot of extended editions, exclusive content, and ad-free videos over on Nebula from me, but also from channels like Second Thought and Polymatter. Nebula allows viewers to support creators directly so they don't have to worry about the pesky YouTube algorithm. Nebula is awesome, but it's now made even better with our partnership with CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is the go-to streaming platform for thousands of top-tier documentaries, like The Health of Our Oceans, which includes a stellar interview with marine expert Dr. Sylvia Earle, which I actually used to make this video. And because CuriosityStream loves supporting educational creators, we worked out a deal where if you sign up with the link below, not only do you get access to CuriosityStream, but you'll also get Nebula for free. And this isn't a trial. You'll have Nebula as long as you're a CuriosityStream member. What's even better is that CuriosityStream is offering a special deal for my viewers, 26% off their annual plan. That's a little over a dollar a month for both CuriosityStream and Nebula. By signing up, you'll not only directly support our changing climate, but you'll also gain access to thousands of documentaries and exclusive videos from your favorite creators. So if you want to support both our changing climate and hundreds of other educational content creators, go to curiositystream.com OCC or click the link in the description and sign up for CuriosityStream and Nebula for just $14.79 per year. That's 26% off. Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end. If you've already signed up for CuriosityStream, you can also support me by becoming an Our Changing Climate patron. Just pledging $1 a month gives me the financial stability I need to keep making more videos like this. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in two weeks.